Welcome to a special on location of the Death Piles and Taxes show. And we call it a bonus episode. This is at the uh, eBay Sell Up Meters Group. Meetup group of our local uh, eBay. This is at the eBay headquarters in Draper, Utah. And they had a special guest speaker that night who was none other than myself, Adam Beasley, the tax man. So I hope you enjoy it. Now, without further ado, uh, we'll introduce our main speaker, the CPA. First, I'm going to give uh, Adam and Derek a little shout out for the Death Piles and Taxes guys. We have set up guys. These guys run a podcast. We got Derek Everett, Adam Beasley. Uh, it's a great podcast all about eBay selling. I mean, there's some fascinating stuff. They just did a one, two, I believe two episodes ago called the Jerry Sloan episode where Derek came into a bunch of Jerry Sloan estate items. The story's so good you need to go listen to it and I may <laughs> twist Derek's arm at some point to share it up here with pictures. Uh, but anyway, the podcast great. I suggest you listen to it. Uh, death piles and taxes. Two things that are certain in life they tell me in 2020, right Derek? That's right. Uh, anyway, what up Adam? you wish to introduce yourself, or do you want me to? Either way, I can probably do both. All right, you can introduce yourself better, and do you want questions as you go, or do you want to do it at the end? We'll go through it at the end. So. Okay. So, everyone, uh, my name's Adam Beasley. Uh, like Bill said, I've been doing taxes. This will be my 15th tax season. Um, over my career, I 100% specialize in small businesses. What I mean by that is businesses that do revenue less than about $5 million. Um, I do this because uh, it's going to be weird to say it, I love it. Um, I love numbers. I grew up wanting to be the payroll account for the San Diego Padres. That was my 10 year old dream. <laughs> I knew I was awful. I could not play sports, but I loved numbers. So I really love the money aspect. Not necessarily the numbers, but the money aspect of it. So, um, like I said, I uh, have dealt with res resellers. Um, like when the internet kind of got going about 2005, eBay really got going, so very familiar with it. Um, there's always questions about taxes, because here's the thing, every single one of us in this room have to file our taxes. Um, it's just one of those things, and as you are reselling, there are several new things that happen. And if you're not familiar with them, it can really come to, uh, to bite you in the butt. There's a lot of things that you want to know about, things that you should be keeping track of, things that you shouldn't be keeping track of. So I'm just going to go over a couple of those, and then we'll go into some Q&A. Like it says, I am an accountant. A lot of times you'll hear like disclaimers on, you know, I'm reading something on YouTube, like consult your accountant. I am an accountant, so be, feel free to ask me those questions. Um, the first thing is, what is an LLC, a sole proprietor, uh, an S corporation? Is anyone in here an S corporation? You guys are an S corporation? Anyone an LLC? You guys should be an LLC and an S corporation. That's a trick question. Um, the rest of you should be probably sole proprietor. No probably about it. You're either one or the other. Um, the only difference to that is, is where are you filing your taxes? Meaning, is that showing up on your personal return on a Schedule C? Or is it showing up on an 1120S, S Corporation, totally separate tax return? Um, a lot of those things, the LLC aspect, I, this is, I say it frankly the way it is, if you do something so dumb and they have a good enough lawyer, they're going to sue you and that LLC means nothing. So everybody thinks, well, I'm an LLC, I'm going to save my house, I'm going to do everything. The reality is it, it's just kind of a, a wording on the end. A lot of people like the way it looks. It's nice to have, I definitely suggest it, but it's not like if you're a sole proprietor and you're using your social security number, it's not the end of the world. So 
it all depends on, again, what your end game is, how long are you planning on doing this, what you really want to do. Um, to become an LLC, to get an EIN number, that way you don't have to give your social security number, is extraordinarily easy. You can do it yourself, you can go on the IRS website, you get an EIN number, um, you register with the state, it's like 50 bucks. So that's one thing I like doing. The government already has your social security number, but the less you have to give it out, the better you want. So uh, the question that I get a lot of is, is why should I become an S corporation versus a sole proprietor? Sole proprietor is, is a lot simpler, and it's all based on dollars and cents. Um, how much money are you making? Sorry, I was going to start my recording and I forgot. <laughs> We're going to put this on our podcast, so. so are you going to start to give, gen give generous applause? Uh, you can if you want to. Uh, no, I am not starting this again. <laughs> um, so the question is, S corporation, sole proprietor, it's about your net profit, okay? And that's one thing, I really appreciate you bringing that up. That's one thing you want to know. Just because you sell $60,000 worth of stuff on eBay, great, that's amazing, those are good numbers, but what you really want to be looking at is your net income. How much money are you actually going to be paying taxes on? Um, if that number, your net income is about $30,000, that's when it becomes advantageous for you to be an S corporation. And the reason being is an S corporation allows you to save money on self-employment tax. Um, how many in here have a regular day job that get paid by an employer? Hopefully everyone in here knows what Social Security and Medicare is. My favorite thing to do is when I teach this at high schools and I teach this at the university is just because you get paid $10 an hour and you work 10 hours doesn't mean you're getting $100. You, nobody looks at their paycheck stub anymore, let's be honest. Like just goes direct deposit and I don't know what that means. Uh, you pay Social Security and Medicare. As a reseller, as your own business, guess what? That Social Security and Medicare, now no longer are you just paying your part, you're also paying the employer portion. And that's 15.3% in Social Security and Medicare tax alone. That has nothing to do with your income tax. It has nothing to do with your state tax. That's just Social Security and Medicare. So the, the example is if you're at $30,000, you're paying 15% in self-employment tax alone just on that $30,000. So you really have to think about that saying, well, that's about $4,500 in Social Security and Medicare tax. And again, keep in mind that has nothing to do with your other stuff. Um, so that number is where an S corporation can come in hand and help you out. Uh, as an S corporation, you can pay less of it. You actually pay yourself a payroll, um, just like you would at your any other job. Your own S corporation, your own company, will pay you a small wage. So instead of paying $4,500 in self-employment tax, now you can get closer to about $1,500 or $1,200. So the more you make, the more you save. So that's kind of the, the broad, the, the low end number is that $30,000, $35,000. If any of you are approaching that, good job, keep doing it. Um, that's really, again, something that you'll want to look into. That's the easiest, biggest way when I look at people's stuff is I like write on their, write on their uh, 1040 on their Schedule C and I look and see how much they're actually paying. And every one of you in here should have a Schedule C on your personal return. Um, if you are selling on eBay, the eBay is required to send you information if you have uh, 20,000 in sales or 200 transactions. And here's the other thing. Um, I'll say it, I've said it in the past, a lot of times people do Venmo, they do cash, they're getting there. My guess, I would be willing to bet within the next two, three years, Venmo will start issuing 1099s just like eBay is. This whole flying under the radar thing is, it's gonna be a thing of the past. One thing that is brand new to the IRS this year, um, when you file your tax return, there's actually a check the box question and answer. Do you have or are you selling any virtual currencies? So this Bitcoin, all of these other things, like the IRS is coming hot on them, that is an actual question that you have to answer on your tax return. 
which means again in here if you are doing any Bitcoin transactions, trading with people, it's the IRS is going to know about it. So that's the first thing. The other thing is keeping track of your stuff. Does everyone in here please say yes? If you don't, I'm going to come kick you. Okay, good. <laughs> that's the next question. Yes. If, if anyone in here, <laughs> do you all have a separate bank account for your eBay transactions? Everybody, please raise your hand. If you're not, pretend that you are and you're going to go do it. That is the biggest number one thing that you should be doing is just to keep track of those things separated um, so that come at the end of the year, at the end of the month, however, you keep track of your stuff. You can realistically say, yes, I know what that was for. That's my biggest pet peeve. And that's not just with resellers. I deal with a lot of um, construction, a lot of salespeople. Um, a lot of things, and if you don't, you're not the only one. 90% of America doesn't have a budget. We're all spending stuff, no idea what's going out the door. So keep track of your stuff, and you'll have, uh, you just have better success because, like that gentleman in the pack was saying, like you need to know how much money you're actually making. So that's the other thing. Um, there's always, the, the, another part is receipts. This is actually something right now, I am currently in litigation with the Utah State Tax Commission for a client that in the past you've always said, well, if you have your bank statements, they're as good as a receipt because that's just kind of what the IRS, the state wants. This is the problem that we're having right now with the specific, um, we're in a, a sales tax audit. As we all know, the world of sales tax is a completely unknown wild, wild west. Nobody knows anything about it. We're in an audit litigation regarding paying sales tax. I'm going to leave a little tip on here, and I, again, I don't know how many of you are doing this, but the state of Utah legislation asks one of the questions on your Utah state tax return is, did you purchase anything online and not pay sales tax? And if you did, you need to tell the state of Utah that you spent $2,000 buying things online on eBay that you bought in California. You are not responsible for paying sales tax through eBay, but now the state of Utah wants you to report that. So I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but that is something that you should be doing. It's a very, very finite thing that the state of Utah doesn't know how to do because it's one of those question marks they don't know how to report it because there is nothing. But again, as we get more into this electronic age, that is going to change. Um, so I, I, that's one of the things that I always think about is you're supposed to be doing that. Um, how many of you in here just not saying whether you do or did not know about it? How many people knew about that? Good. That's, that's a fair margin of people. So, um, so again, uh, going back to the receipts. Uh, the issue that the state of Utah is having with this business is when you are buying things the same thing, if you're buying something out of state, you're not required to pay sales tax. So now we had to go through, even though I gave them bank statements, I gave them credit card transactions, we now have to prove that we paid sales tax on certain items. So for instance, this company buys different goods and they have them in their store. We have to prove that I spent $300 on Amazon to buy toner cartridges and I paid sales tax on it. So as I go through, and honestly, you'll hear a lot of things on the internet saying don't keep receipts. Until about six months ago, I would have agreed with that. But now absolutely, I 100% disagree with that, just for this specific situation. And now I'm not telling you to keep every single receipt in your, your pocket. There's many apps. You can take pictures. I would absolutely suggest to you, if you get a receipt, you should keep some sort of record of it. Because I am going through this process with the state, and we're not talking $500. This is like a $28,000 audit that we're going through just for sales tax alone. So. Um, I'll get to the last one there in a second. So kind of going off of those, what questions or what things relating to your reselling business or even personal type issues can I uh, hopefully clear up for you? So me, like when I sell something that I bought from Apple. Hold on just a second. I'm actually going to come back so everybody can hear you. We'll, we'll use the second microphone. 
Speaking of Apple, I'm going to throw a story from the Death Piles and Taxes uh, podcast. The whole reason we started a podcast is because taxes, let's be honest, they are not sexy, they are not wonderful, we all have to pay them, but trying to find somebody to talk about them in an entertaining fashion didn't exist. So Derek and I made some attempts. We've done it for a year. It's absolutely insane how many people download our podcast every week, and I love it. So hopefully I can answer your question. We went to the Apple um, headquarters in California. Derek bought quite a few items at 50 bucks, and he's already reselling them for 100 bucks. So you can make money anywhere. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So you paid for it, like it says, you paid for it at some point, and it is your item that you purchased. Again, now you're getting to the question of, was that an actual business expense when you purchased it? Like, was that an act of business? Or is it something that you purchased five years ago, and now you're selling it for a profit of 100% because you paid for it, used it personal use, and now going through and saying, well, now I'm reselling it. And you're saying, well, I didn't really purchase it in 2019, but I sold it in 2019. So should I take, I sold it for 200, but I paid 100 for it. That's a great question. And that would be something I would leave up to your discretion. And what I mean by that is, if I were you, I would say that I put that piece of equipment into my business or I made it inventory. And at some point, I did pay $100 for it, and now I'm selling it for $200. So I would include that as a $100 expense or a cost to get sold. Does that make sense? The opposite. You pay $200 for it, and you sell it for $100. The same thing as you would sell it at a $100 loss. Yep. And again, all of these questions, like all of these items, this gets into one of the biggest things, is your absolute bookkeeping. Like, unless you're keeping track of everything in a finite spreadsheet saying when you purchased it, when you bought it, how much you paid for it, those are all things that you can't just throw a dart at the wall at the end of the year and have a realistic expectation. Because a lot of these things, like we're talking garage sale items, and they're, they're, you just really want to know what it was. So. Here, here's, how, here's how we get into most of those questions. It's called de minimis. Unless you have lots and lots and lots of transactions and a $50 thing is going to make sense, don't worry about it. All of these things are like they're great questions, they're great things. Unless you're really getting into some big high dollar things, it's very, um, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Do that with a car and not your Apple Watch. Correct, yep. <laughs> so I have a question. So with e so with eBay remitting sales tax now for Utah, um, I have run across many, many sellers who do not have any tax accounting software whatsoever and are strictly relying on PayPal documents or trying to find something on eBay for how much tax was collected on their behalf, how much they've sold, all the things. What would you say a good tax accounting software is for just a normal seller like me that has 1,200 listings? So that's a great question because here's the thing, bottom line, Who's responsible for collecting and remitting sales tax? Wrong, it's you. It is not eBay's responsibility to pay sales tax. It is not eBay's responsibility to file sales tax. It is your responsibility. Just because you're using eBay, it's your company. It's just like you hiring an outside accountant. Like it, Bottom line, it is your job to make sure those are correct. Um, there's another big thing also. I'm not sure if anybody in here has ever been to an Airbnb. Does anyone have an Airbnb as a business? That's again another huge thing. Airbnb, VRBO, all of these things like, you are supposed to collect what's called a hotel tax. Again, these, all these taxes like Airbnb allegedly collects it, allegedly not. I mean, these tax issues are so, difficult that e even eBay, even like these big companies don't know. So getting to your point, it is your responsibility. Every one of you in here has a partner. 
I'm not talking your spouse, your significant other. It is called the government. It's the IRS in the state you live in. They are your partner of your business, and they can either be an excellent asylum partner that you never hear from, or they can be your worst nightmare. And it's your job to make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to. So with sales tax, the same exact thing. You need to make sure that your line items that are coming in and coming out, again, it's your responsibility to look at it and actually know how much sales tax is supposed to be coming out? How much am I really responsible? Has anyone in here filed a Utah sales tax form before, a report? Okay. They're, yes, and they're getting more difficult. And the one you just did for last quarter is going to be different for this quarter. So this is, again, me speaking independently. You should go see this man right over here after when you're done and just talk to him. <laughs> Because the, the, the new sales tax stuff, the new tax initiative, it's, I, I'm, an, I, I'm an accountant and I don't even know what's going through it. So that's the problem is these sales tax issues are becoming more and more difficult. So as far as software or something, I use QuickBooks Online for all of my transactions. And the reason I use that is that's what I'm most familiar with. If you're a part-time seller, it, it is a little expensive. It costs 20 to $25 a month, but I use it for my stuff because I'm familiar with it. I know Derek uses uh, GoDaddy bookkeeping. For him, that's a good one. Yeah, that's what we use, too. Yeah. It, for our level of selling, it's perfect. But it's yeah. basically 10 bucks a month. Yep. So GoDaddy bookkeeping is, is a very good one. And, and hopefully what it does for you is it makes you more cognitive of what is going on in your transaction. And, and the other thing that it also does is it at least gives you hopefully a better idea realistically what your fees you're paying and also what your shipping are and your PayPal fees. Because then you can really, again, get to this gentleman's here is, is, is what's my profit margin? Am I really making money or am I just doing this because I feel good when it's 11 o'clock at night and I get the ch-ch-ching and it wakes me up. <laughs> so hopefully that's what you're doing. Again, it is your responsibility to know those transactions. Correct. There, when you sign up for those sales tax, there, there is a yearly amount. And again, I don't know what they've changed it to because everybody that I have just does it on a quarterly basis. But the one. Yeah, yearly. Uh, yearly in Utah. Yes, yearly in Utah, correct. So, for example, we sell on Amazon also. Uh -huh. So, Pennsylvania is very anxious to get sales tax from us. At least previously they were. So, we had to file sales tax in Pennsylvania, and that was twice a year. And so uh, I'm really hoping the sales tax stuff actually levels out a little bit because filing in 50 different states would be insane. <laughs> if, if it, it again, that's, that's the question is, okay, each one of these states have like a threshold and the problem is everything is different. So as me as a eBay seller, which I actually am, Derek, figure if we're going to have a podcast, we better be doing it ourselves. So I have a store. Um, that is the question is, if I'm selling in Pennsylvania, if they're remitting taxes, they will to a certain point, but once you go over a threshold, whether again that's 100 transactions, 500 transactions, 1,000 transactions, every single state is different. Um, when and if you do get to a certain point, because they don't make you file at certain points, so we're talking you know, if you're below like the $5,000 amount to a certain state, there isn't really much to worry about. But again, it's your business. You need to make sure that you know what that dollar amount is. Um, so right now they are filing a lot of those for you, but there's actually a software, a company, it's called um, Avalara is, is the company. And I know that they're partners. I've seen a lot with eBay, a lot of other sellers. So if you are selling, you know, two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand dollars, and a lot of them are different states. They will actually take care of all those transactions for you. Yeah. Yes. No, that's for becoming an S corp. No matter what, if if you make more than six, if you bring in more than $600, whether that's garage sale, whether that's eBay, whether that's Macari, whatever the thing, you have to file an S corporate, excuse me, you have to file a, a sole proprietor Schedule C on your personal tax return. If you're an LLC, you just file it on your personal If you're an, if you're an LLC sole proprietor. 
And if you don't know the difference, you need to see, have you, do you have an EIN number? Yeah. Okay, you need to look on your EIN number. How long ago did you get it? You, I'm sure you're, you're probably a sole proprietor and it, it, it just goes on your, your Schedule C. So you don't, have to, you don't collect any salary for yourself? Doesn't matter. A, a, a sole proprietor Schedule C, like whatever you make is your salary. You just report on your personal Correct. All of that goes on your personal taxes. You are paying self-employment tax on that. You just don't know it. Yeah. Not separately. You don't have to make quarterly payments. You just file it. Correct. So your quarterly payment, that's a good question because quarterlies and quarterly tax payments are two separate things. Quarterly tax payments are if you run a company, have payroll taxes, you have to pay payroll taxes. And that's a problem. Like there's over like 95 different filing dates and forms and everything that I have to know. If you are, own a company, you have to pay payroll taxes every three months and file payroll reports. If you're paying quarterly tax payments, that would be just like you said, if you expect to owe more than $1,000, so let's just say you have your regular day job and you are selling on the side and your net income is about 10 grand, and let's say that increases your taxes, so instead of breaking even, you're gonna owe $3,000. The IRS wants you to pay a quarterly tax payment, which means you're paying towards your federal income tax that will be due. And it's really weird, like their dates on it are really weird too, so it's like January, April 15th, and then June 15th, why it's only two months, I don't know, and then another date and another date. So that's what those payments are regarding. It doesn't matter. You don't pay that. You don't have to pay a quarterly payment. It, correct. Yep. And again, those are optional. I mean, they, if you don't pay it, you pay a penalty. So, and, and going to that, that's a good point. A lot of people that I have do that, and all I tell them to do is I tell them to increase their withholdings on their regular job. So I would say, hey, you're killing it on your outside. Just have an extra $500 a month withheld on your regular check, and that'll cover it so you don't have to go over the estimated payments. Okay, back on sales tax for a minute. Yes. Gentlemen, been in 50 different states. Yep. Let me put 50 more on that with two words that we have in Utah, and that's local option. Yes. Our business, a, whatever we sold within the state of Utah, Taxable, it was on point of sale. Yep. So it was Salt Lake County, Salt Lake City. Yep. Okay. State came along seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. Ooh. Yeah. We heard it. We heard it. That's the sound we all live for right there. That's right. <laughs> At any rate, if you ship something by common carrier to yep. Burnham, St. George, you charge their sales rate, not Correct. Correct. Yep. Has that changed? Will it change? That just adds to the problem. First thing you do is you take that packet and you go see your legislator and you bring up that same question. Because I've been in the state capitol. You know what? You go in there and tell them yourself. Uh, and and I, I understand. Like I said, this is, this is the awful nasty part. I've been to the state capitol myself. I've met with Gary Valentine, the tax commissioner, all of those things. It's your responsibility to make that happen. Like it says, I get it, you can complain to the tilt, but write emails, do everything, because it is, it's becoming more difficult. We had to vote for it before we could read it at the Yeah, that's, again, another time and a place, but those are all appropriate things, and I said I do this for a living, and it, it's hard for me to tell you that, hey, this is what it was two weeks ago, and it just changed this week, and I don't have an answer yet. So, And again, that is the same point. Every one of these things that just voted, like for instance, where we live in Payson, our sales tax was just increased by 0.1 of a percent for a new recreation fund. So now when I charge sales tax, my rate needs to go up by that much to make sure I'm withholding enough taxes. So. So those are fun things. Anyone else have a great question? I know, I think you had a question about an IRA or, or something when you were in here. Yes. Great, let's see if I can answer that one for you.
I rolled that into another LLC IRA and operate with my side business, part of this uh, eBay business, or even my side hustle and selling things locally um, through my IRA and keep records, keep it separated and segregated that I can build that account up tax-free until I until I have to start taking out that uh, self-directed. It's called a checkbook IRA. Yep. That's getting into the very finite gray area. <laughs> As you see a lot of the things on, I'm sure you've seen some things on uh, like TV, like pull all your money out of your IRA and put it into gold and silver and put it in these different things. It's a, it's a great like finite gray area. And again, it depends a lot on the dollar amount we're talking about. Now, if you're pulling out, you know, $100,000 a year or whatever the, the dollar amounts, you have to really look into saying, what is my management fee on that kind of an IRA? Because a lot of those times you have these self-directed IRAs, you have to look at it, are you transferring from a taxable or non-taxable traditional Roth IRA over to a self-directed? Um, are you older than, are you older than 59 and a half? So you won't have the penalty, but you still have to look at it saying, I'm pulling the money out. Am I going to be taxed on it now, later? That's a great question. And again, it's that finite gray area to where if you're going to do it, the dabble, is, it's in the details. You absolutely want to look and see exactly what it is and who's ever going to be managing that self-directed IRA, how much do you have to pay in fees? Does that make sense? Kind of? Kind of. I understand what you're saying. Uh -huh. Yeah, you can't collectible assets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't do those, but, but other things I, I can. I can purchase and then sell them and then put that profit and then put that profit back into my checkbook IRA yep. and respend it. But as long as I keep the details. Record keeping for it. Yeah. One thing I would definitely look at too is, is as you're answering that, right now is the absolute best time as far as taxes. And what I mean by that, the tax rates have never been lower. So one of the options you may look at and saying, well, you know, even if I do pull this money out and pay taxes on it, now I can put it in my regular business and it's just like you taking money from a savings account and put it into there. So my suggestion would be is realistic. If you want a real answer, I'm happy to give you one. Let's look at your last year's tax return. Let's look at what your plan is this year and let's give you some actual numbers. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I have another question. That's what you should. Um, I don't know a lot about taxes. This is all new to me. So I sold an item to a buyer who was, they did pay sales tax on the item. Okay. And I got a message that said they're supposed to be tax exempt. They wanted to know how to get their tax that they paid back. Okay. I don't know. They that, were working here at eBay, so I told them to go back to the state and make sure that their certificates were showing that they were tax exempt. Okay. Because their eBay account didn't reflect that they were, because when a buyer or a seller is tax exempt, they're flat. Correct. So, how does a buyer get to be tax exempt, first of all? Second of all, if they're charged tax when they shouldn't be, how do they get it back? That is a great question. Does anyone in here, have they sold anything to a tax exempt organization? Okay, first off, it is absolutely your job to collect that payer or that buyer's sales tax exempt certificate. That is your job that you have to do. Just because somebody says they're sales tax exempt, who, who cares? They have to A, first give that to you. The hard part now is you saying, well, you've given me the certificate after the fact. What kind of a dollar amount are we talking? A couple hundred? Ten bucks. Ten bucks. If I were you, I would say, send me a copy of the certificate, and if you can actually see that it is a sales tax exempt certificate, I would just send them a refund, or send them a portion of that, because you don't need to try and get back into that back and forth, because right. it just makes it harder than what it is. But again, it is your responsibility to collect that other person's sales tax certificate. Does that make sense? Great. Yes, Yes, it, it is, and like I said, that's the whole issue is they're supposed to do that, but 
after the fact. It's again, it goes to the, you send somebody an item, they want a refund for this, how much is, I call it the pain in the ass factor. Do you yeah. want to have it or not? Just exactly. for 10 bucks, I don't care, get away from me and never call me again. Right. <laughs> they're, on, they're on the flag list, like when somebody calls in. <laughs> I, I'm an accountant and I have a lot of those. So when somebody calls in and I know, oh yeah, they're on my C list, their price is this. So, Okay, so I hope, let me grab your question right here. Um, hopefully a little less stressful than all the tax questions. <laughs> well, it is tax related, but so I've asked this question before to other people and I've never really gotten a good answer. We buy at an auction, the lots are just mixed goods. Yep. You pay 50 bucks for that lot, 200 bucks for that lot. By the time we load it up, it's all in trailer, it's all mixed together, we have no idea. Yeah. So... Average cost of sale. If you got 50 items, each item cost a dollar. That's thing, don't even know how many items, because half of you end up throwing out. Then if you had 200, I mean, then again, you're getting into the de minimis stuff. I okay. mean, we're talking, call it 50 cents, call it a quarter, it doesn't really matter. Well, and that's what I've done at the end yep. of the year, I see how many active listings I have, and I just assign them a dollar. Yep, know? and, and, that's, okay. and that's just perfectly fine. I mean, wouldn't that also just hit what I always call the prove me wrong? <laughs> Correct. Oh. Again, we get into this, the IRS isn't going to go after somebody's business who's looking at 30000 They look at it a reality, because a lot of times with this type of a business is, is this a hobby or is it a business? You should never have a loss reported of more than three thousand dollars, four thousand dollars every like in a year. If you are having losses of more than three thousand dollars in three consecutive years, the IRS can come back and say, "You're an idiot, Jonathan. This is not a business. You are funneling your hobby. Stop doing it, and we're going to disallow all those losses." Okay. They'll come back and say, all three of these years returns, that 3000 or 30000 I've seen a $100,000 loss before. They're just going to come back and say, that's really income to you. Don't do it. By law, the way the IRS says it, you have to be operating a business, and you can only have losses in two of five years. So make 10, make 15, make 25, and then don't lose money in, in three consecutive years. Does that make sense? So again, going to the, just make sure it's clean, make sure everything looks good. Um, again, I'll kind of look in that. Realistically, you want to look at it and say, does it pass the eye test? Did I spend $30,000? Like, is that what came into my account? And realistically, again, looking at your profit margins, you should be making some money. You should be making five, thousand, seven thousand. Again, that's when we can get into the things that are for business, our business trips that we take to Arizona. We go to the DI opening. While we're there, we may or may not go to a Phoenix Coyote game. Like those are all kind of the, anytime you go on a trip, go sourcing, like go sourcing, look for stuff. There, there you go, make, make it a fun trip, yeah. Correct, yep. Yeah, and, and that's again to the thing I look at and say, okay, realistically, do I need to take all of those expenses for my driving? Because you don't want to end up negative. You don't want to be on that sole proprietor, on that Schedule C, that line. You don't want it to say negative $2,000, negative three, because it doesn't do anything for your taxes. Like, yeah, you might save 200 bucks, but it's just not worth it. So every year you should be making you know, minimum, I'd say minimum $500, but it depends on how much money you're selling. If you're selling 30, 35,000, you should be making minimum two to three thousand dollars just to kind of keep you off the radar. If your business is doing more than a hundred thousand dollars, even if your net income is kind of below that, you should be an S corporation. And the reason I'm saying that the hundred thousand dollar like gross number, when eBay sends you a hundred thousand dollar, they're gonna look at you and they're gonna say, because what they, they have all these algorithms, it all is done on a computer, and they say hundred thousand dollars, how did she only make three hundred dollars? Oh, let me look, she spent five thousand dollars on trips to Disneyland. Like, <laughs> they, they all look at those numbers, like, so you just wanna make sure you fall in that good range. Have we talked about that? One more? Yeah. And I don't know if you'll have an answer or not, um, but so we're an S corp, and my concern is, is that going to make it harder for us to get a mortgage when we want to buy a house? Ooh, that is a great. That's a great question. 
That's a great, great question. Are you paying yourself a wage currently? Yeah, but it's not a ton of money. Okay, so that's the question. This is always the biggest double-edged sword that I deal with as a small business owner. I want to A, I hate the government. I don't want to pay them any more money in taxes that I want to. So I'm only going to say I made $50,000. I want to buy a new house. I want to buy a new car. I only make $50,000. I ain't giving you a loan. <laughs> so now you have to look at it and say, where do I really want to be? So a lot of time what I suggest to people is especially this time of year, let's make more money this year because this is a lendable year. So I would say instead of making 50, let's make more than to 80. You're going to have to pay some more taxes, but now you're more lendable. So that's the same conversation that I always have with clients. In December, we talk about is it going to be a lendable or non-lendable year. Fun are you, stuff, are you, huh? Are you okay with a couple more? I, of course I am. And if you guys don't know, his name, is, it's not Bill, it's $100 Bill. Because I know he's always got a $100 bill in his pocket waiting to give it to somebody for something. So that's how I refer to Bill. Uh, I'm a good. <laughs> I have to say, I did like when you attacked me with that model. Um, another something, you guys have nick both, both have nicknames you haven't shared a lot on air, but we'll kick this to taxes for now. Sure. Um, I don't see a lot of happy faces out there with what you're delivering, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have a question. Sure. So, uh, um, hopefully this will maybe put a little sunshine in it. What's the real deal with, with the new tax thing and how the first 20% or something of your income is now non-taxable as a business? Is that something we can avail great. ourselves? Great, that is a great question. And like most tax things, that's kind of halfway it and we'll hammer it home. It's called the, it's really dumb, and again, you won't see it unless you know what it is. It's called the, the Qualified Business Income Deduction. Essentially what it is is because you're paying self-employment tax, just like everyone else, you get a pretty sizable deduction on the amount of money that you make. So again, kind of what happens, we'll go back to that $30,000 number. You're going to actually get a deduction to pay on your income taxes, not your self-employment taxes, but your income taxes will be reduced by a much larger amount than what it was in prior years. So you get a qualified business, they call it QBI, so that's what you're referring to. It's 20% of, it's not a 20% deduction, it's a 20% number of 30,000, so it's essentially $6,000 deduction of your $70,000 wage that you get at your real job, your $30,000 of your self-employment income, and it reduces it by that. The tax code is so stinking complicated. It's the most insane thing ever. And so, and the good news is for anyone who has babies, now those babies are worth $2,000. Congratulations. There you go. They're worth more money. Same thing with college age kids. Like before, once they turned 17, you didn't get anything for them. Now you can still get 500 bucks. If any of you are filing taxes with any kids in college under 23, you should absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, be filing your taxes at least together. Don't file them. You, you'll want to file them separately, but you'll want to look because there's a fairly large um, education credit. That's $2,500 for potentially mom, mom and dad. Whereas if a kid does it themselves, they only get $1,000. And a kid gets wahoo because I'm going to get $1,000 because of this. But if mom and dad do it together, they can get $2,500 instead of just $1,000. So that's I don't claim her? absolutely, even if you don't claim her. Okay. Yep, there's a lot, of, it, it's, it, it, there's, there's a lot of things you want to look into it because you may claim her as a dependent. It's again, it's looking at let's run the numbers both ways and tell you who's going to be better off. Cool. That's good to so. Thank you. so, my question is deductions. Okay. So So, so I hope that this is your husband, right? Okay, great. You just said some guy, like you're just paying your kids, huh? Um, that's actually a really good question. So, again, at paying your, your kids, that's a... Because they, they help. So correct. Right, yeah, you, can give them, you, can give them, you can give them cash. You're, when I say kids, anyone, as long as it's less than $600. 
if it's if it's technically if you pay them a thousand dollars you're supposed to give your kid a 1099 again it goes into the de minimis how much dollars and cents are we really talking about um, but as far as looking at missing expenses or, or things the 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 highly most highly looked at thing on individual taxes that people put all the time is office in the home a lot of times you can put it's called an 8829 you actually say that I have a physical office in the home the problem is is when you do that they absolutely look at that and all of us use our offices as office in the home because we do it both but in order to pass the IRS test that office in the home has to be mutually exclusive your office space has to be just for your business. You cannot go in there in your office and the same thing, same computer, and play fantasy football because they're going to look at it and say, well, that's not an office expense. Now, again, it's that very, very rarely looked at thing. So you just look at it and say, well, if I'm doing this office in the home and doing all these things, but it's only a $1,000 or $1,200 deduction, what I do is on the sole proprietor on the Schedule C, I just go ahead and put my utility amount at about $1,200. Because you're paying your utilities on your internet, on your home, and in your other expenses. So that's one thing I do is you want to make sure you get those expenses, but it's just a matter of where you're putting it. So paying your kids one is great. Obviously paying your cell phone. Um, let's be, I mean, every one of us are looking at eBay stuff no matter where we go. We're all scanning, we're looking at things and looking it up, so your cell phone is absolutely an expense for your business. Now, I don't do it all of it, but most of it I probably do 85 to 90 percent because that's, that's the reality of it. Um, same thing, getting into your question about can we put money away for um, our kids. If you have a significant business that you're doing, and even if it's part-time, you could be putting money towards a SEP IRA so that again you can be saving money for the future you're deferring taxes potentially 20 25 percent so what i tell everybody if i put a thousand dollars into an ira i essentially it cost me 750 dollars because i just saved 250 dollars in taxes so there's a lot of different things hopefully does that answer it any other specifics buy a new ipad buy a new phone I did that. it's perfect you should be doing that every year me too. I was like, no, let's be conservative. I like that. <laughs> but, but I mean, if you're only getting, like buying a new computer every year, you're only getting to that deduction. You're not getting dollar for dollar of that money back. Well, again, that depends on if you've got a computer habit like Derek does. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I totally agree with you. I, I, I wouldn't spend a thousand dollars to save two hundred and fifty unless it's something I needed. I just think it's funny because she went to hair school, and I hear people all the time, "Oh, you go out to eat for a visit, write it off." And then I think some people are like thinking in their head it's dollar for dollar. It's not. It's, not it's with that. It, it isn't. But if you're going, like I said, there's a lot of things that can be in that gray area. And the biggest thing is, is again, document it, document it. If you're going out to eat, make sure you say this is what it was for and, and this is what it was, especially with that receipt. So again, there's like on QuickBooks Online, you can just take a picture of that sales receipt. It'll pull it right into your transaction. You know, a lot of things too, like you can take a picture and then delete it. You can put it in its own little folder. I mean, it's not hard anymore than what it used to be. So $100 bill, I could go on all night. I, mean, I know this is a dry subject, but this is hopefully in informative to everybody. Do you guys have more? I can ask you all night long. <laughs> well, hey, that sounds great to me. <laughs> Derek doesn't go to the gray area, does he? I Derek do. doesn't even know what his taxes are. He just gives them to me and I make sure it looks good. <laughs> I always tell him I'm not going to let him go back to jail again. <laughs> Here, another one. I've done my taxes for years, and usually I use TurboTax. Uh huh. It's very negative. No, if you know what you're doing, great. Like it says, here's the thing I look at it. TurboTax still charges you, like it's not free, 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 free. I, I'm guessing you might pay $100, $125 for that um, because you have to file with the sole proprietor uh, and a Schedule C. Most like accountants, you can get an accountant filing that kind of a tax return. Average price is probably about $300 to $500 to file that kind of a return. Um, again, you look at bottom line is it's not, not peace of mind, it's can this person that I'm hiring me save $250 finding me some exemptions that I didn't know about. 
that's the, that's the drawback to it. And if you like doing it, then great. And how long does it take you? Is it something that you want to pull your hair out? Because it's a touchy subject for a lot of people. Yeah, let's see. Well, then why would you quit playing it? <laughs> the question I have is, I seem to be able to manage to, to do a lot of expenses. Everybody does. <laughs> a lot of expenses. And I can usually take care of all day and come Yep. So where's the final line? That's kind of, again, we talked about, like, I mean, if you're bringing in money, like it says, if you're bringing in, I don't know, what the, we'll just say 25, 60 to 75,000. You should be showing some money on that, like to call it the fair range, like the red zone, like making sure that we're safe. I would say you should be probably minimum making no less than 15,000. That's kind of where I wouldn't feel any more comfortable going lower than that, because then you just kind of throw yourself in that, that audit area saying, well, how are these guys bringing in 65,000 every year, but they only make $500? And like I said, the more and more you do that, like the reality, you're probably never going to get questioned about it. But again, it's that peace of mind, like, do I want to pay, you know, because again, it depends on so many other factors. Do you have other income? Do you have other kids? You know, you always want to make sure you're showing some form of income. That way, you know, you're not on the radar. You don't want to be on the radar. And the reality, most of the time, any of these audits are even going to happen. They're correspondent audits, and it's because you got a 1099 from a different resource. So if you get one from eBay, you did your stuff, you reported that income, but you may have had a different one from uh, Macari or any of these other type sellers, and you forgot to put it on, that's what the IRS gets, is they're going to say, oh, you forgot to do that, not you know, not you're under that threshold. So hopefully that answers that. We want to be in the pay as little as we have to, but make sure we're in the safe zone. Unless we're going to buy a house, we got to have more income. So, okay. Can I ask you one, one more real life example that happened to me with the gray area? Throw it to me, Bill. I imagine you dabble in the gray. <laughs> I like that. The gray is good. Um, it goes with, uh, Expenses on a trip. So this summer we're in Canada. You guys will relate to this because it's got a sports thread to it. Um, we're in Banff. Uh, there's a thrift store. Of course, I'm going in. Wife is angry as usual when going to a thrift store. Uh, you guys knew that's not the case. Feel blessed. But anyway, I go in there and I, um, I see on this rack they're kind of shredded up, these two hockey jerseys. And I'm going, in. you know, I don't have to like a crap. Are those real? I look at them. Yeah, these are real. You know, 1960s, etc. Anyway, to make a long story short, I tagged these two jerseys in Bath for like three bucks each. One sold for 350, one sold for 300. How much of a week-long family vacation would be okay to put when you're basically it was a lark to go into the thrift store for it? So realistically, on that trip, because of the dollar amounts you sold them for, again, it has to be realistic. You spent you know, $6 on some items that you sold for $600 between the two of them, I would absolutely write off mileage up there and potentially one night of your hotel stay. Okay, so, that, that sounds good, but you it, wouldn't go so far as to go, oh, I'll take a week. No, because you don't need it. Again, it's, it's the reality of... It would be reasonable. What's the reasonality behind that? And again, that's kind of why I say is, you know, if you're going to go on a trip, great. You know, make sure that you include that, document it. But I, it's at the end of the year that we're really looking at the big scheme of things. If I made $60,000, do I really need to write off that $5,000 trip for a bill to go shoot a caribou? Okay. Anything else? Like I said, taxes are great, wonderful. I'll have some cards up here. If you have any questions, feel free. Like, I love answering questions. I do a lot of this. And like I said, feel free to reach out to me. I'm, I don't care if you call me to do taxes or not. I'm here to just answer some questions. Um, I like doing it. These are great. This is always fun. This, it, to me, it's just like a game also. It, it's a big game making sure that you're doing the right things. But again, you want to stay off the radar. So. Um, and most of these stories, like so we talk about taxes all the time in our podcast. Um, it, it's just fun stuff. That, that story, we talk a lot about that. So hopefully, um, you know, if you do have more questions or if you want to know more, we're happy to uh, answer in any possible way. So thank you so much for eBay for having us here. This is awesome. We're really excited. Um, well, I hope you enjoyed that. It's a great time had here at eBay. We appreciate you having us. $100 bill, guy's amazing. Thank you for getting us up on the uh, talking circuit.
Great night. If you have any other questions, send them Adam's way. Deathpilesandtaxes.com. Go to anything, uh, Adam Up Accounting, and uh, we'll see what we can do for it. It's actually Death Piles and Taxes Facebook group. That's right. I, I, don't, I just a throw website, it out there. I'm working on the website. At D-Roy Everett. Two on things for certain, Adam. Death Piles and, and Taxes. And taxes.